this. So I got to see the new Godzilla movie opening night in theaters. And if you're a Godzilla fan, we are eating more than that lizard. Like, we got a new trailer where he's running with Kong looking like Rocky and Apollo. We've got a whole miniseries on Apple TV that's connecting the MonsterVerse. And now we have a new movie from Japan that delivers everything that you want from a Godzilla movie. Godzilla. Minus one. It comes from Takashi Yamazaki, who not only wrote it and directed it, but the dude even did the VFX for it, which reportedly only cost $15 million. I don't know if the real number is still up in the air and people are discussing like where they cut on CGI and stuff, but just the fact that it beat out a bunch of other blockbusters to make the Oscars shortlist for effects is insane. It even beat out the what about the atomic bomb, so call it karma. It is also full circle considering the director gave Godzilla a cameo in one of his older movies. <laughs> So after making that one, and then also working on the Godzilla ride that's in Japan that I really need to go to, they got him to do this movie and release it on the anniversary of the first Godzilla, continuing the legacy of the longest blockbuster franchise out there. Now personally, I give it a solid combo price. I do think that the acting gets a little soapy at times with the drama, and the effects can sometimes look a little stilted, but again, it's everything that I look for in a Godzilla movie and a trip to the theaters. So with a full spoiler warning, let me explain. So the movie takes place in 1945, right in the final days of World War II, where our main character, Koichi, has decided to dip on his position of being a kamikaze pilot and takes a detour to an island pretending like his plane needs a mechanic. Little does he realize, though, that he would have been safer up in the skies. Literally the night he arrives, the sirens go off, causing all the troops to think that there's going to be another bomb, but it ends up being Godzilla, and it just rips through all of them in this insane one-shot. The only survivors are the main mechanic who was there on the island, and Koichi, who ends up surviving after blacking out, but he feels even more blamed because he could have at least tried to shoot Godzilla like the mechanic had told him to that night. Instead, he just sat there watching Godzilla eat them all up like he was in the theater with us. That's why when he gets shipped back, another soldier straight up gives him a stack of pictures for all the dead soldiers and their families so that he can feel more guilt. Even when he gets back home and his town is completely burned to a crisp because of the war, this neighbor lady rips him a new one and blames him for failing his mission and even puts the death of her kids on his head. <laughs> Side note, Sakura Ando is in Koreeda's new movie Monster, which is also out this year, and I highly highly recommend that one because it's in my top five of the year. After a little bit, Koichi goes into town to mope some more when a random woman getting chased passes him a baby, like just legit flea flickers that child and goes long. Surprisingly, he doesn't abandon this post and after a while realizes that Noriko also isn't the parent of this kid, but she also took the baby in her arms after the parents were killed in the air raids. So now Koichi and Noriko are in the same position and move in together and even start raising their non-child with some help from the neighbor, as Koichi then gets a job playing real life Minesweeper. Pretty much, him and his crew have to shoot and blow up all the leftover war bombs that are out at sea, and since he's the most trained out of all of them, he ends up taking the ranks, but even with all that extra cash that he's making, this man's guilt still has him waking up from nightmares on the daily. Yeah, especially since he did see a giant lizard in the 40s. The movie does give a brief explainer on how Godzilla was awakened since there was this Operation Crossroads where the US was testing out nuclear weapons out at sea and now that's where our main character commutes for his 9 to 5. We do end up seeing the crew bond though where we have Captain Tatsuo who runs the ship, there is the engineer named Kenji, and then the youngest of the group who's the only one who's never served in a war called Shiro. They even have these nice moments where they come over for dinner and learn about them not actually being a, a family family, that they're not married, but it's the circumstances that brought them together. But Koichi is so stubborn that even though he's caring for this little girl, he refuses to accept her as his daughter and doesn't even want her to call him dad. And that's where I was ready to shame him. <laughs> Eventually, Godzilla does appear again while they're out in the waters working, and we get one of the craziest boat scenes since Jaws. They try to outrun it, not realizing that they're going to need a bigger boat, a bigger bomb, a bigger budget if they think they're going to beat it this early. But right at the last minute, a boat arrives saving them, but then also completely sacrificing itself as Zilla sinks it faster than the Titanic. After knocking out for the second time, in this movie, Koichi gets airlifted to a hospital where they all learn that the government is just not going to tell the public so that everybody doesn't freak out. They'd rather them freak out right when the monster does a surprise attack on a city and right before they all die. The big issue is that Noriko just got a job in the city where Godzilla is going to attack next, and when Godzilla arrives, it's almost like targeting her since it goes directly for the train that she's on, leaving her to reenact that last Mission Impossible movie. We then get one of the best scenes with the theme playing at full blast. You know, they say Superman leaps over buildings in a single bound, Zilla's eating them with its single mouth. This 
thing's a thick boy, so it's tearing up blocks with just its knees. It's even got the news doing sports commentary on the live attack at eye level. And then somehow, this man Koichi arrives out of nowhere just in time to pick her up from the ground. That's when the army sends in the tanks thinking they're gonna do something, but the moment Godzilla goes blue, they're through. Everything just gets obliterated, and for whatever reason, right before it blasts all the people that are running away, Noriko somehow has the strength of a running back and stiff arms Koichi into the alley, saving him but leaving herself to get demolished. But like, this ain't Titanic. There's room in that alley for the both of you. Instead, she and 30,000 people, as they reported, all got eviscerated, and it starts raining radiation oil everywhere. <laughs> That's when they assemble the remaining troops and pitch a plan to kill it. And I love that it comes from Kenji, who's not just the engineer in the war room, but you know, a dude who's actually out there in the battlefield. Pretty much the idea is that they're gonna attract it with a recording of its own voice in order to tie it up and trap it so that it sinks to the bottom in order for the sea pressure to crush it. And if that doesn't work, they're then gonna balloon it to the top to compress it even more. So in other words, they're hitting this Titan with the ocean gate trick. Problem is that a lot of the troops just don't wanna go. So a lot of them end up quitting to go be with their families as if this thing isn't gonna come for their families. But you know, I do get it. Not everyone's gonna be as lucky as the lead character who already survived it a whopping three times. So let's make it four to call it a routine. Koichi then spends a bit of the movie to go find the mechanic from the beginning island so that he can prep his plane and finally commit to his kamikaze mission and finish the war that he has inside his soul. But once he finds him, dude gets knocked out again. Koichi was able to bait him into coming because he put all the blame of the soldiers on him, which obviously got him pissed off, and then he came in with a beating. But the mechanic also helps him repair this special Shinden fighter since Koichi plans on getting redemption by flying straight into Godzilla's mouth and sacrificing himself, leaving his toddler with the neighbor who also lost her kids. Kenji then gives this really great speech about how the country never changes and breaks down everything, about how the armor tanks were poorly made, how the jets had no ejection seeds, and the fact that most of them were not even dying from the war, a bit of starvation and disease, and even calls out the suicide attacks that the government pushed on them, and as the movie shows, was even expected from everyone in the country. So after fighting on planes, trains, and automobiles, after fighting on land, water, and sky, they're ready to take it to the depths. The team's able to lure it out of the water with a recording of its own roar, and then bait it with an empty dummy boat, causing it to use its heat ray, which is really smart because it's going to give them enough time since it takes a while before its HP replenishes. So with Koichi circling it from a above, they're able to tie up Godzilla and sink it, but then it starts tugging at their tugboats before chewing out of the trap. That's when all these smaller boats appear and come in to help like it's Dunkirk, and that includes the young Inchiro, who was told to stay back because, as they quote, it's an honor to also not serve. Obviously, if they're fighting, they should be fighting for someone's future and they want it to be him, but I think it also adds to the fact that when you have such a big threat, it's gonna take everybody. After singing Godzilla and pumping it back up to the top, it comes out looking all crusty, but is still ready to wipe them all out since its heat ray is back in full use. But right before it's about to blast, Koichi flies the jet right to it, busting in its mouth. That's when the movie shows us a mini flashback where the mechanic, seeing Koichi's guilt, tells him about the ejecto seat that he installed, leading Koichi to not just save the day, but his life as well. Now, I do think that forgiveness is a really big part of this story and I was really impressed by it, but the fact that a Godzilla movie was also talking about suicide, you know, and the will to live even through the guilt that you carry, I thought was pretty profound. You know, it's something that goes with Kenji's speech and what he was calling out earlier. I, I think it's also one of the reasons why Noriko chose to push Koichi instead of also saving herself, since it became something that was so rooted in the country that giving up one's life was considered the correct thing to do. So, it's kind of like the most pro-life movie where the guy successfully aborted his mission. That said, even with Zilla crumbling to the ground, it still has those regenerating powers, so after everyone leaves for their happy ending, it starts mutating underwater ready for a sequel. That said, that's when the movie hits us with the wildest twist that I... I don't even know. Look, I know that this is a movie about a giant blue beam breathing lizard, but it was exactly that heat ray that completely obliterated this girl. H how did she get blasted to the third act? In a crazy turn of events, right after they saved the day, Koichi gets told to go to the hospital where Noriko has somehow survived, looking better than she did in the beginning of the movie, but they also zoom in on her neck to show that she's got her own mutations running through her veins, so if Godzilla can regenerate, then I, I guess she can too, because I don't see how she survived a blast that killed tens of thousands when this girl had a front row seat. It also is something that's been hinted at in previous movies, uh, most recently Shin Godzilla, where there's stages to the evolution, and one that got cut out of the movie but was revealed in behind the scenes was this form where it started to shed to become more human-like, and, and in a sense becomes Mother Nature, It eventually leads it to go from a monster to a bunch of little creepy beings that soon connect as a hive mind and actually do become a god. 
hence Godzilla. So I am curious to see if they'll ever flesh that out in the future. As for this one, I think it's a feel-good ending that a lot of audiences liked, but I thought that they already had a profound one when Koichi realized what he was fighting for. That even though he had trouble embracing his new daughter and being called a dad, in the end, he does become one and chooses to live for her. 